when I walked into church this morning, uh, I was told, hey, the choir sounded great today. And I thought, what did I miss? What did I miss? The church hasn't started. You all do sound great today. Thank you. Thank you for leading. Every once in a while on a Sunday morning, you walk in and you hear a song and a song just, just speaks to you. You hear a song and you say, yeah, that'll preach. And then you think, okay, I'm, we can go home. And that was, that was that last song. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, we are continuing our journey through the story this morning, a, a journey that we've been on for a few months, um, and we're going to be in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, uh, and, and as we turn there, as we, we open the Bible together, will you please join me in prayer? Gracious God, we thank you so much for the gift of your scripture, for the gift of your story. As we open our Bibles this morning, we ask that you'd give us ears to hear what you have for, your, for us, and that, that you would take our hearts, take our, our thoughts, take whatever it is we take away from, from your message, from this message, and that you would use us and use these words and use this reflection for your kingdom. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So last Sunday was a, was a big celebration, right? This is where you say, yeah, yeah, it was a big, it was a big, a, thank you, choir. Yeah, thank you. Well, that Sunday was a, a, a wonderful celebration. There was a moment where my, my son was running around on the grass during, during uh, the Easter egg collection. He said, it's candy Sunday. It's candy Sunday. Good son. I'm glad, I'm glad Jesus means a lot to you too. It was, it was candy, candy Sunday. A, a big thank you to, to everyone who, who helped to make Easter the celebration that it was last week. If, if you were an usher, or a greeter, if you, you sang, if you helped set up the egg hunt, if you, you did anything, if you were here, thank you for being here to, to make it a, a special day here at WPC. And in, in fact, what, what we do every Sunday, whether it's the big Easter candy Sunday or, or any other Sunday, really is a moment for us to kind of kind of pause and to celebrate the resurrection. In fact, every Sunday that we gather together, every Sunday when we come together to worship, we, we are having mini Easter celebrations. Every Sunday we're coming together and we're saying, yes, the resurrection still matters for who we are. The resurrection still has an impact in the world today. And so we're gonna gather together every week to sing songs of praise. To, to pray to the resurrected Lord, to, to greet one another because the Spirit draws us in to, to do that, and then to go out into the world and to tell the world about what Easter means to us, but not just to us, to everybody else in the world as well. We, we celebrate that, that, that God came into the world, a hopeless world, and, and gave us hope. So as a church, we have spent the, the better part of the last year journeying through the story of Scripture, journeying through the narrative of Scripture, and so much of that journey prepared us for what we celebrated last week, prepared us for, for Easter. But what takes place after Jesus' resurrection in the Bible is, is, is just as important as what comes before it. And, and after Jesus' resurrection is where we see the launch of the church, it's where we see that the beginning of, uh, of God or Jesus' followers to, to kind of take that message into the rest of the world. In the fall, we're going to spend some time uh, unpacking parts of, of the book of Acts. We'll read about the joys and the struggle of, of the earliest Christians and, and, and talk about some how, how the lessons that they learned, we can still learn from today as well. They still apply to us today as well. So today, we're, we're going to kind of begin that journey, but in the fall, we're going to spend some more time really diving in to, to the book of Acts. So last Sunday, we, we, we talked through the immediate response that some of Jesus' first followers had to the resurrection. Mary was overwhelmed. Other disciples were afraid. Thomas had questions. All, all the same sort of struggles or, or questions we have about faith today. And, and Jesus responds to, to Mary's feeling of being overwhelmed by, by calling her name. Jesus responds to the disciples' fear by saying, experience peace 
No, the peace of Christ goes with you. Jesus responds to Thomas's questions by saying, yes, search them out. Search them out. And so one of the things we talked about last week is, is our response to Easter is to do those things, to, to listen for God's voice, to, to experience the peace of Christ, to know that the peace of Christ goes before us in a chaotic world, and to dig deep, to, to ask questions. That was some of what we talked about last week with the response to Easter. But this morning, we're looking at another response to Easter. The apostles walk with the resurrected Christ and, and they're invited to be a part of bringing hope into the world. It's the same invitation that, that we are extended in the church today. Luke starts the, the book of Acts by making it clear that, that he's writing a sequel to his gospel that he's writing a, a sequel to what he had already written. He writes, in the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from, the beginning, taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. He's summarizing Easter. He's summarizing what happened with, with the resurrection. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. So, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time? Is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? It's the sort of questions that, that kids ask on a, on a family road trip, right? Where, where within moments of leaving the house, sometimes before you even get out of the parking lot or out of the driveway, the kid says, are we there yet? Are we there yet? It's the disciples asking Jesus, are we there yet? Are we there yet? We're not given the intimate details of every conversation he has, the resurrected Christ has with his, his disciples, so we don't know exactly how much insight he, he gave them into to what had happened before the crucifixion or, or if he explained some of his more confusing teachings. We, we don't know those intimate details, but we do know that he spent time talking about the future. That he spent time talking about the present and, and, and the future. That he assured them that the Holy Spirit was coming. And they respond to Jesus' invitation into the future by looking to the past. They respond to Jesus' invitation to the future by, by looking to the past, to restoring the kingdom of Israel. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Now there's a great warning for the church today here. Sometimes we lean so heavily on the past that we almost get stuck there. And we miss the opportunity that God has given us today to bring hope into this world. Now it would be easy to say that the question the disciples asked proves that they just didn't get it, but I don't, I don't think that's the case. They're not just missing the point. Remember, they expected, when Jesus talked about God's kingdom, they expected it to be in the sense of, okay, he's taken down Rome. He's taken down Rome, the glory days of the Davidic kingdom, it's coming. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And Jesus replies, it's not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A couple of nights ago after, after putting our, our kids to, to bed, 
Haley and I, uh, we, we, we watched a movie that we had been waiting to see for a while, that my wife and I had been waiting to see for some time, Christopher Robin. Have any of you seen Christopher Robin? It's been, been out for, for a little while. It's a fantastic movie, and a movie I can, I can say without hesitation. You all should watch. Your pastor can say, yes, you should watch this, this, this show. Uh, uh, like a lot of kids, I grew up with the adventures of, of, of Winnie the Pooh, uh, w- of Tigger, with, with, with Eeyore, with, with, with the entire gang. Haley and I found ourselves laughing while, while, while Pooh's kind of naive hope, hopefulness was, was, was on display. Well, well, Tigger hopped around and all of his excessive energy was, was, was bouncing around where, where Eeyore was deeply convicted that he's not important, that he'll never be important, that he never will really have a place. Oh, poor Eeyore. Now, I won't give too much of the movie away, but, but I will say this, as, as Christopher Robin returns to Hundred Acre Wood, it, it's clear that he's grown up that he's lost his imagination, that he's forgotten his sense of adventure, his hopefulness, that he's forgotten those things. And and Winnie and Eeyore and Tigger, they're they're tasked with saying, hey, you gotta find it again. You you can find this. Those those traits, the sense for adventure, the hopefulness that that Christopher Robin carried were were, were defined in in the character that A.A. Milne based off of his son, Christopher, Christopher Robin. Now, it's a danger that many of us who are adults face today. And one of the reasons why kids are so important in our lives, both, both in the church but just, just in general, a couple days ago, we had one of those rare moments um, in, in our house where you just want to hit pause, where you just want to take a picture and say, can we live here forever? Well, my, my, my oldest daughter, she was at school, um, and, and my son, who's almost four, and my, my youngest daughter, who's, who's almost two, they were, they were playing very nicely uh, in, in the living room floor, and, and my son crawled up into my wife's lap sitting on the couch, and, and he pulled out a, a piece of paper, a, a drawing that he had created. It was a map of the world. And, and as he talked, you, you could almost see the wheels spinning in his head. He was pointing to the different places on the map that he he knew. And then he said, you and dad, mom, you guys are gonna go to England. And Abby, Abby McLean, one of our students here, one of our, our, who babysits our, our kids every once in a while, Abby, she's gonna come and stay with us. His imagination had had taken over, and soon Piper was listening, and I was standing on the the stairwell listening. The world, the map of the world was literally in his hands, and he had this adventurous plan that involved everyone he knew. When Jesus leaves his disciples, he leaves them with with the world that, that he created, and he invites them to be a part of the adventure of bringing hope into it. And and that same invitation is extended to us today. So in the first part of Acts, Luke tells us that that right after Jesus shares his last words with his closest friends, they're left kind of staring up into the sky. Two men in robes, they appear and they say, fellas, why are you looking up? In the same mysterious way that, that Jesus came in, or the same mysterious way that Jesus ascended, he, he's going to, to, to return someday, someday. It's as if they're saying, hey, stop looking upward. You, you need to be thankful for what Jesus has done while he is with you. And don't worry, he's, he's coming again, but you need to stop looking up and you need to start looking out. You need to start paying attention to the world that is around you, because that is the world that Jesus has called you to go out into. You need to pay attention to what's happening right now. In some ways, the two men, they, they kind of reinforce Jesus' last words with his, his first followers before his ascension. And the disciples ask the are we there yet question, Is now the time that you are going to restore the kingdom of God? And Jesus starts by saying, 
It's not your job to know the time or the season or the, the periods as NRSV translated. It's not your time to know the, the time or the season. The, the, the timing is up to the Father. While Jesus' response might not have been exactly what the disciples were, were, were hoping to hear, it was one that was consistent with what he had taught them earlier. Now, there are two words that, that Luke uses, two words in Greek that, that Luke uses when he's talking about time. Kronos and, and kairos. Kronos is the Greek word that we get what from? Guess. Chronological, chronology. It's kind of a, a timeline. Kairos is the other word, and, and it sometimes translates to here as, as periods. Other places it translates to seasons or kind of specific events in, 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 in a time. It's, it's used more for kind of these, yes, yeah, specific events would be a good way to put it. So, so the point for the disciples and, and for us really is that God is in control both of the big picture, the, the, the chronology, the timeline of it all, God is in control of that, and God is in control of the, the specific events. We're on a need-to-know basis. There's something frustrating about that reality. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> but there's also something a little freeing. There's also something a little freeing. Many of Jesus' parables, especially those that we often refer to as the, the kingdom parables, where he says, the kingdom of God is like, and then goes on to tell, tell a story or a riddle, have, have a component that involves time. So we have a story where a, a landowner hires workers in the morning, midday, and afternoon, and then gathers them together to pay them in the evening that there's a time component in that parable, and a riddle about seeds that are planted in one season and then harvested in another. There's a time component in, in, in that parable. They all remind us that God is ultimately in control of time. But there's also a call to be responsible with the time that we have been given. There's another place in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus is talking with the disciples. He tells them not to worry about food or clothing or, or anything else. There's a time component there as well. And that the Father is eager to give Jesus' disciples the kingdom. That the Father is eager to give Jesus' followers the kingdom. And then Jesus goes on to tell a story about, about two servants. One servant who, who stays at home preparing for the master's return. And another, another servant who, who kind of uh, throws big parties and he abuses the reality that the master is gone and is, is coming home later. We can't know the time nor the place of Jesus' return. It's not our responsibility to know it. That should be freeing. It's not our response. We don't have to be in control of that. We're not in control of it. But it is our responsibility to spend our time wisely while we wait. And we do that by finding time and space to give everyone on our path hope, pointing them toward our creator and, and showing them God's love in, in real, tangible ways. Jesus continues by telling the disciples to wait, but to also know that there's something coming. He doesn't leave them empty-handed. When Luke writes about the power of the Holy Spirit, he uses the same word that other New Testament writers used to describe the supernatural power that Jesus himself carried. And so the disciples would have heard that and they would have said, what? We're gonna be doing the things that Jesus is doing? Now that's either incredibly empowering or, or, or terrifying, maybe both. For some of them, that, that promise would have compelled them to accept the reality that God was in control, that, that they had nothing to worry about. And, and, and others, I had to imagine people like, like Thomas, it, it would have made them have many more questions. So, what, what do you mean, that power I'm, I'm going to have? What, how does that look? What, what, what is that, that, huh? How does it look? How long do we really have to wait? What happens if the, the Roman guards come while we're waiting? They had to at least be a little impatient. So we're on a journey right now as a church, and you've heard me talk a little bit about our, our Vision 2020 team and uh, some of the work that the rest of our leaders are doing as well. As we spend time listening to what God is doing in our community and around our community, 
And we're trying really hard to be intentional, to stop, to pause, to pray, to wait. But I got to be honest. There are times where I want to get there right now. There, there are times where I want the picture just to be clear right now. Where I want the path to be just, just clear as day for everyone, for all of us, that we're all on the same page. We're just, okay, here we go, right now. I want that, I'm impatient. Anybody else ever struggle with being impatient? It's so easy to fall into the trap of thinking that moving forward on our own time, plotting our own destiny with our own plans is the right move. But here with the disciples, and really with a lot of what we've read through the story in the last few months, we're reminded to pause and to listen, to pray and to listen, to be still before we move. We need to make sure we're listening to where the Holy Spirit is moving, and then once we've discerned where the Holy Spirit is moving, we need to jump in with all of what we have. Jesus' last word to this group of disciples are a charge to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Sumeria to the ends of the earth. So when my son drew his map, when my son drew his map of the world, included every place that he knew. San Diego, why? Because his cousins and both sets of grandparents, they live in San Diego. The Ram's house. The Ram's house, what do you mean? Well, during the football season, we'd run around our house. Whose house? Ram's house. So he drew Ram's house on, on, his, on his map in England, where mom and dad are going to travel to because mom's best friend from college lives in England. He, he, he described the entire world. Everything he knew about the world was on this one sheet of paper. So when, Jerusalem, when Jesus says Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth, he lists the disciples' map, everything that they knew everything that they knew. And it starts with their home. It starts with what they know best, where they live. And from there, they're invited to reframe how they understood God's kingdom. Remember what I, what I said is the way that they understood God's kingdom is that God's kingdom was going to come to restore Israel to what it was during the heyday of David and Solomon. And in this last challenge, this charge to the disciples, Jesus is saying, you need to rethink how you understand God's kingdom. That starts with where you live now. But it's not just about what you know, where you live now. It's, it's even beyond what you know. God's kingdom doesn't stop with the places that they know or the people that they know or the traditions that they know. It's much larger than that. It extends to the ends of the earth. The, the story of Jesus leads us to Jerusalem, but the story of the church moves us out of Jerusalem, moves us from Jerusalem. And the disciples were given a task, as well as the authority and the power to tell the world of what they had witnessed. They got to tell a story of hope that changed the present and the future. And today, we get to continue telling that story. We get to continue bringing hope to a world that desperately needs it now and in the future. I know some of us are, are newer to WC and, and that some of, some of us have been around th this church for a long time. But, but if we think about our identity as a church, if we think about our history as a church, from, from our founding pastor, Bob Boss, knocking on doors in the neighborhood, to, to founding the preschool, to starting the preschool, to, to launching the Westminster Free Clinic, to planning Light Shine, all of these things that this church has done that have all been about bringing hope to a world that desperately needs it, starting right here in Westlake Village in the Conejo Valley. Those are wonderful things. They're the foundation of who we are the foundation of our identity. I could go on and on. We've always been a community that's about bringing hope to people who need it. But our challenge today is to build on those things that I just discussed, to build on what's been done, 
and to find new ways to do what the church has been doing for 2,000 years. When Luke writes about Jesus ascending into heaven, he, he, he doesn't dwell on it. You notice that? He, he gives just a couple sentences to Jesus ascending into heaven. Instead, he shifts most of Acts. We get two sentences about Jesus' ascension. Most of Acts is about the task of the church, about the task that, that we have to bring hope to a world that needs it. May we be a church that waits on God, that, that listens to what the Holy Spirit has for us, and may we be a community that brings hope to today's world, starting in our own neighborhood, starting with the street fair that starting in, started 10 minutes ago, and extending on to the ends of the earth. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we know there are people in our world who desperately need to experience hope. God, help us to be patient, knowing that you are in control. God, help us to hear your voice and help us to remember the calling that we've been given. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.